Hello, and welcome to the second of three lectures on the material in Chapter 6. Now, Chapter 6, as I mentioned last time, extends the stuff that we talked about in Chapter 5. Chapter 5 introduced us to the basics of forces. Now, in this lecture, I'd like to focus on one specific force. It's the centripetal force. So, we know from uh, our conversations way back in, I believe, Chapter 4, that there's this stuff called centripetal acceleration that pops up any time that you have uniform circular motion. So, if you think about something going around in a circle like this, and this being the radius of the circle like that, then as it goes around at a constant speed, we know that in order to maintain this circular motion, in order for it to maintain its path, oops, that to get a change of motion from here to here, if it were going around in this direction, we'll say, you would have to push inwards. So there is an inwards force, a centripetal force. That's present anytime you have circular motion. And this should make sense if you go back and you think about Newton's laws, specifically Newton's first law. We know that objects traveling at a constant velocity or at rest like to continue to do that. If there is some external force, some net force acting on something, then we expect a change in its motion. And here, clearly, as something goes from here to here along this semicircular path, we'll say, it's experiencing a change in motion. And if you think of the direction that you would have to push to keep this on a circular path, the direction is going to be in towards the center. Okay? So, as I said, this is uniform circular motion. So, you're traveling at a constant speed, and obviously the path is a circle or a section of the circle. Okay, now, so that said, let's take a look at an example. If you swing a rock that's attached to a string around at a constant speed of 15.5 meters per second, what is the tension in the string? Assume that the string is 1.25 meters long. So we're going to draw a picture. Here's a circular path. Looks something like that. Maybe not a perfect circle, but we're going to go with it. And this is the radius of our circle right here. And we're given that the length of the string is 1.25 meters long, which tells us what the radius is. Now let's just pick a direction here for this thing to move. Uh, the convention generally is that it's going around in a counterclockwise direction. And the reason is because if you think of coordinate systems, specifically we'll say from... Uh, I don't know, uh, whoops, uh, algebra or something like that, um, the direction here from x towards y, this direction right here, is considered positive angle. This is the positive direction of motion when you're going around in a circle. Now, uh, we have a mass. I didn't specifically tell you what it was, so I should do that. Let's say that the mass is uh, 1.25 kilograms. And uh, it has a speed, which I'm just going to call V, of 15.5 meters per second. Now, I'll write out the givens here in a second, but what I would like to do is to take a look at the force diagram for this thing. 
Now, if you remember uh, way back in uh, section two, or chapter two, rather, uh, there was a brief discussion about different types of coordinate systems. And we mentioned, you know, circular polar. So here, uh, polar coordinates fit the, the, the dynamics of the situation very well. When you locate something, it has an angular position, and it is r away, uh, you know, from the center of our coordinate system right here. Uh, now, that said, um, really the only place we're going to manifest that is looking at our Newton's uh, laws here. So if we look at our force diagram, and I think of uh, this as being straight up, uh, you know, I'll call it Z, if you will. Uh, here is our, our object. Now, uh, what's happening is, is, is this thing goes around in a circle. Its inertia says, I would like to continue going in this direction. I want to keep, I want to obey Newton's first law, basically. I'd like to keep traveling in a constant, uh, a constant velocity. But the string itself constrains this thing to move around in a circular path. So what happens is, is because of this inertia is constantly fighting uh, the motion here, or the change in motion, if you will, then what happens is, is the string is pulled taut. Okay. Now, so you may be inclined to think that this is something called centrifugal force, centrifugal force. There is no such thing. Okay. It's not a real force. Now it's an effect. It's an effect that you experience when you live in what's called a non-inertial reference frame or not inertial coordinate system. And we may briefly talk more about this later on. Typically, this is something that's uh, covered in great detail in what would be uh, the next version of mechanics or university one, which is called classical mechanics. Now, that said, a non-inertial coordinate system is one in which the coordinate system itself is experiencing acceleration. For example, here, if you were to ride along with this rock as it swung around in a circle, you would feel this desire to be outwardly flung, kind of like if you're in your car and you go around the corner uh, and, and you feel this, this, this force trying to sort of throw you out the door, if you will. It, it's not a real force. It's a consequence of your inertia trying to fight the change in motion that's being applied to you. So here... We live in a non-inertial coordinate system. There is no outwards force trying to fling us like that. But there is a force that's inwards towards the center, and that would be the tension. The tension of the string is what's causing the force that's creating uh, the change in motion that we see. So you have an inwards force like this, this attention. Okay? And if we neglect gravity, which is exactly what we're going to do at the moment... Um, that's the only force that we have present, okay? So this is along the radial direction, okay? This is along the radius, the radius of the circle. So outwards from the center is considered positive R. Inwards towards the center is considered negative R, okay? Whoops. There. So. We have our mass, we have one force, and that's the tension, okay? Which means that if I were to sum up the forces here that were acting on my mass here and, and you know, causing to experience this uh, change in motion, so we get our net force, we only have one. There's a tension, and if you think about what's going on in the radial direction, I'm going to call it the R direction, it points inwards towards the center, like that. Okay, and you know, just like uh, forces are m times a, uh, this would be m times I'll call it a sub r. Okay, now so uh, here's our force diagram. Uh, you know, we've written out uh, you know our expression of Newton's second law, if you will. Looked at all the forces that are present. Uh, let's just go ahead and write out what we've been given here. Uh, we're given. Uh, the speed that this rock is going around is at 15.5 meters per second. Uh, I had to make up a mass because I didn't put it in the problem. I'll overlook that. Sorry about that. 1.25 uh, kilograms. And uh, the radius 
of our circle because of the string's length is 1.25 meters. What I'd like to find is the tension, which we can find using this. But the trick here is to observe the fact that our acceleration is an inwards acceleration, and it's a centripetal acceleration, which means we already know what our uh, a sub r looks like. It looks like v squared over r. Okay, we already know its form. Okay, we may know, not know its value. We actually, uh, you know, we'll be calculating that here. But this is what it looks like. So, so our tension in this case, if we solve for it, is minus m v squared over r, 1.25 kilograms times 15.5 meters per second. I have to square that. And then dividing by 1.25 uh, meters. Okay. Uh, the 1.25s are going to cancel each other out, which means that really the only thing that we're doing is uh, squaring 15.5. And uh, let me get my calculator here. Let's see here. Two hundred and forty point two five uh, minus two hundred and forty point two five uh, newtons uh, towards the center is what it would be. Now you'd express it this way. You can say that the tension in vector form is radially inwards. Okay, we're going to get to that here second, but the minus sign here means radially inwards. And since we have uh, three sig figs here, it would be something like uh, 240, you could put 240 dot newtons to express this as three sig figs, or you could write this in scientific notation, and then say it's back into the center along the minus r hat direction, because this would be out. This would be along r hat. Okay. Just like this direction right here is in the direction of the sweeping angle, this would be theta hat. But we're not going to really get into that a whole lot. Okay, so this would be fine. Or just expressing it this way and rounding it properly would be okay too. But here you go. That's your tension. So here's the tension that's actually, you know, keeping us on, you know, this uh, circular path. Okay. Now, so let's do another one. The Earth orbits the sun once a year and at a distance of 1.5 times 10 to the 11th meters. Assuming that the speed of the orbit is constant, what force does the Earth feel from the Sun as it orbits? The mass of the Earth is 5.97 times 10 to the 24th kilograms. So, uh, here's an orbit. Looks pretty good. Um, here's the Sun. Let me put the Sun in the center. This. There's the Sun. And then, uh, oops, I didn't want to do that. And then um, here's the Earth right there. Now, so here's a line from the center of the sun to the Earth like that. And this right here is going to be the radius of this orbit. Now, in truth, um, the Earth really does go around the sun in almost a perfect circle. Okay, the difference between you know, say the length of this axis and the length of this axis in terms of the shape of the orbit is uh, is negligible to the point to where that the seasons are not due to the Earth getting closer to or further away from the sun, but the seasons are a consequence of the tilt of the Earth as it rotates on its axis and goes around the sun once a year. So we'll be talking more about that later on. Now, so this, though, is the radius of that orbit, and uh, it's 1.5 times 10 to the 11th meters. Uh, this is also called an astronomical unit, by the way. Now, we know the mass of the sun, uh, or the mass, mass of the sun, the mass of the Earth, that is, uh, 5.97 times 10 to the 24th kilograms. Okay. Now, we also know a little bit more about what's going on. You know, for example, we do know that the Earth here makes one circumference, one circumference, every year. Okay. So that's a speed. Speed, we know, uh, you can think of as distance over time. So here, the distance would be two times pi times the radius of the orbit 
and time would be what we call the period of the orbit. This is the period. Okay, so for the Earth, if we needed to calculate, you know, uh, for example, its speed, which is one of the things we're going to need to do, it would be 2 times pi times 1.5 times 10 to the 11th meters divided by the period of the orbit. Now, it goes around in one year. Um, one year, there are 365 days in one year, 24 hours in one day, and then 3,600 seconds uh, for every uh, one hour. So this right here would get us the amount of time you know, that it takes uh, for the Earth to go around. So uh, if we do this, I get 2 times, let's see, is there a second function for pi? Yes, there is. That's nice. Uh, times 1.5, 10 to the 11th. And then I'm going to divide that by... 365 times 24 times 3600. So, so as the Earth goes around the Sun, it's actually traveling around at something like uh, 29, I'm going to put this as 886 meters per second. Okay, that's rounded towards the end. Um, 29 kilometers per second. This is one of the reasons why uh, we get really scared about things like asteroids and what have you hitting the Earth. Because um, typically what's going to happen is the Earth is going to kind of smack it sideways. Okay, which means that, you know, most of the debris that would be hitting the Earth, you know, if it were coming in, say, straight towards the sun or something like that, would, would hit the ground at about 30 kilometers per second, which we'll be talking more about. Uh, when we talk about kinetic energy, but let's just say that that's, that's a lot. That's very, very fast. Okay. So, so now we have a speed, right? Um, so I'll just, I'll just put this over here. Uh, let's pretend the earth goes around this way. We'll say, uh, here's its speed, uh, 29,886 meters per second. Okay. Now let's draw a force diagram. So here's our force diagram, and it's just like the previous problem, where um, you know we, if if we're living here on the Earth as we go around, we're in a non-inertial coordinate system. So this would be in the direction of radius out. Uh, this will, will again, we'll just call the z-axis to give us an up and down. And uh, and here's the Earth right here, right? So there's only one force that's present, and that's the force uh, due to gravity. Uh, that's the force that's generated between the sun here and the Earth that keeps the Earth on its orbit. Now, incidentally, this is the same rationale that we're using right now that Isaac Newton used in order to deduce the existence of gravity. When he looked at the, the orbits of the planets around the sun, what he realized was that it was an incorrect question to ask why the planets don't fall into the sun, because according to his understanding of motion, Objects should travel basically in a constant, at a constant velocity unless there is a force present that's acting on them to change that. So here, if I were to suddenly somehow shut off gravity, the Earth would fly away in a straight line. So it's not going to fall into the sun any more than, you know, uh, when you swing a, a rock around on a string, if the string breaks, it's going to suddenly cause the rock to go flying into your eye, which, you know, is something that my mom told me when I was a kid. So here, this is the same, like I said, rationale that Isaac Newton used to deduce the existence of gravity. There has to be a force that sits between the sun and the, and the earth that, that makes it do what it does. Uh, but anyway, like I said, this right here is going to be the force due to gravity. This is the attraction of the sun, uh, you know, uh, towards the earth. Now, incidentally, uh, you know, this is the same amount of force that we're getting that's going to be the, the, the pull that the earth exerts on the sun. Uh, now. The, the sun's mass is, is orders of magnitude greater than the mass of the Earth. But there is an observable effect from this motion. Uh, we'll be talking about that in a second. Let me go ahead and do this problem. But this is one of the ways that we hunt for planets. Now, that said, uh, here is our, uh, our situation. This is the Earth. This is a force due to gravity. And just as before, 
you know, if you were to sum up the forces here uh, acting on the Earth to get the net force, there's only this inwards radial force right here due to gravity. Okay. So, so if you look along the R direction, you have this, this inwards force, this uh, centripetal force that's going to act on the mass of the Earth to cause it to experience acceleration, right? And uh, this is centripetal acceleration again, you know, CP, centripetal. So, so we already know the form, uh, and, and you know, just as before, it's going to be minus m, you know, v squared over r, or minus uh, 5.97 times 10 to the 24th kilograms. Uh, 29,886 meters per second. We have to square that. And then we have to divide all of this by 1.5 times 10 to the 11th meters. Okay. So, so if you calculate this, do that real quick. Nine, seven times 10 to the 24th times 29,886 squared, then divide that by 1.5 times 10 to the 11th. You get 3.55 times 10 to the 22nd, approximately, newtons. Okay, that's a lot of force. But look at the mass of the Earth. The mass of the Earth is on the order of 10 to the 24th kilograms. So if you were to actually solve for the acceleration here, the acceleration would be, would be very, very tiny. Okay, now so let me, let me go back and talk more about um, you know, how we use this stuff to hunt for planets. So, so what happens here, if you think about the Earth going around the sun like this, yes, the Earth is pulled on by the sun, but the sun is also pulled on by the Earth. Now, it may not seem like a whole lot, but as the Earth goes around, it's continually pulling the sun like this in this direction. And there's a, a lag. No forces that we're aware of travel instantaneously. Okay, so the universe itself seems to have a built-in speed limit, which is the speed of light. And if you think way back when, say, to chapter one, where you had a calculation that you did that said, okay, how far away is the, is the Earth from the sun, I believe, is what it was in light minutes. It ends up being a little bit over, over eight. What that means is, is that any change that the Earth experiences in, in direction, conveying that force back to the, the, the sun, takes about eight minutes for it to happen. So there's this lag, this, this informational lag between the Earth and the Sun. So if you were to look, for example, at the Sun from space, as the Earth went around it, you'd see the Sun sort of wobble in, sp in place like this. Okay? So as it wobbles back and forth, as the Earth goes around it, you can use the time it takes for one wobble to figure out the period of that planet's orbit. Okay? And as we get further on in the class and we talk about gravity, there is a equation, it's one of uh, a series of laws that are called Kepler's laws, that will help you figure out the distance that the planet is away from that star, or the sun, we'll say, as it orbits. And then there's another version that you can use that will allow you to determine the mass of the planet itself, which is how we are able to figure out there's planets orbiting that star right there. This is how far away they are. And also, this is what their masses are. Okay, and it all is basically derivative of, of, of Newton's laws and, you know, centripetal acceleration, centripetal force. Okay, now, so let's do another example. What is the maximum speed that a car can exit an off-ramp at if the radius of curvature of the exit is 150 meters and the road conditions are dry. 
we're going to assume that there's rubber on concrete between the wheels and the ground and that the car has a mass of 1500 kilograms. All right. Now, so whenever you um, exit the road, the exits that you're taking, the off ramps, are generally sections of a sphere or a circle. So here's a circle right here. This right here would be kind of like how a designer for roads would uh would design it. It's a section of a sphere. And that sphere here has got a radius of curvature. That really is just the radius of the, uh, of, of the circle. Okay. Now, um, let's uh, clean this up a little bit. And what you have here is an off-ramp exit. Okay, it looks just like that. All right. Now, so that said, here's your car, we'll say, going this way. All right. On this particular design, the radius of curvature of the circle is 150 meters. And we also know that our car has a mass of 1,500 kilograms. The question that we're asking here is how fast can this car go before it loses traction, basically, in slides? Now, why would it do that? Well, if you go back and you look at the previous two problems that we did, um, this one right here, where you have this, you know, the orbit of the Earth around the sun. We know that the force that's keeping the Earth on its orbit is gravity. This one right here, the force that was keeping the rock on its, on its circular path is the tension in the string. Now, in this case, if you think about a tire, okay, if you think about a tire like this, and we'll put a side view like this as well. So here's a front and side views, right? At the point of contact right here or right here in the strip, okay, if you were to take a snapshot, this point of contact, even though it changes continuously as the tire uh, rotates, is static. Okay, it doesn't slide. Now, this is called um, rolling without slipping. Uh, we'll actually be talking more about this later on when we get to, to, to circular motion and, and just rotational motion in general. But this point right here is what's responsible for keeping the car on its path. As the car goes around the corner, its inertia says, I want to be thrown out. I want to go in a straight line. I want to go in a straight line. But this contact point, the friction between the wheels and the ground, is what prevents the car from doing that and forces it to stay on the section of the circle. So since the car wants to be flung out this way, you have an inwards force this way that's produced. That's a consequence of friction. So you have static frictional force here. Okay. Now, if you look up what the coefficient of static friction is for rubber on concrete, generally you get something that's around one. Okay. Now, so what I want to do next is to draw a force diagram. And our force diagram is going to look a lot like the previous two force diagrams. Again, we're centering this on the car. And the car is experiencing acceleration. I don't know why I did that. Which means that we're living in a non-inertial reference frame. Okay. Now, this is going to be in the direction of outwards like this. That's in the direction of positive R. And this we're going to call Z. Previously, there was one force, an inwards force. For the Earth, like I said, it was the force due to gravity. For the rock on a string, it was the tension. In this case, it is the static frictional force. But there are also two other forces present as well. You have the weight of the car. And you have the normal force. That's a consequence of the car 
pushing into the ground. Here's your normal force, and here's the weight of the car. Now, I know when I sum up the forces that are acting on my car here to get the net force, of which there are three. There's a normal force, there's gravity, and there's the frictional force right there, that the car is going to experience acceleration. Why do I know that? Well, its path is continually changing as it goes around the section of the circle. However, in the Z direction, unless the car is doing something funny like bouncing up and down like that, the net force is going to be zero, which means our normal force and our weight are going to cancel out as usual. Okay. However, in the R direction, okay, we only have one force. That is the static frictional force, and that's equal to m times a. Okay, so the question here is, if you remember what static frictional force was all about, and let's, let's not forget that when you calculate it, you get a number that doesn't change. Okay, when you calculate your static frictional force, what it's giving you is an upper limit. This is the most force you can push on me before I start the slide. Okay, so the question here is how fast, which is built into the acceleration, can this car go before this on the right side is greater than this on the left side? Because when you go so fast that the required force is going to exceed the st static frictional force, your car is going to slide. That's the question that we're asking. Okay? So, that said, we want to know, and I'm going to write this over here just to sort of make, it, make it clear. When is the static frictional force less than or equal to this right here, in magnitude, okay, in magnitude. We're just looking at the, at the size of the values. Now, we do know the form of the static frictional force. It looks like mu sub s times the normal force. And from this equation right here, we know what the normal force is going to be. The normal force is going to be the weight, which is just m times g. Now. That said, let's come back over here and write out our givens. The radius of curvature is 150 meters. The coefficient of static friction is 1.0. The mass of the car is 1,500 kilograms. And we are trying to find the max speed that that car can take. That's when it's equals. Okay, so using this, we know the static frictional force is going to look like mu sub s times m times g, right? Mu sub s mg m times v squared over r and the masses cancel, okay? I'm going to put this as a strict equals because that's going to give me the lower limit of the speed that I need. And when I do that, I can solve for it. V is equal to the square root of mu sub s r times g. 1.0 150 meters and 9.8 meters per second squared. Okay? Now, if I solve for this, oops, I get about 38 meters per second. Okay. 
So, um, our, our reference point generally is that, let's see, uh, A hundred meters per second, or a hundred miles per hour, rather, is about forty-four point seven meters per second. So this is a pretty good reference to remember, since uh, at least you know most of the people that I know that are taking this class uh, don't generally think in the metric system. And if they do, when they when they drive their cars, they think kilometers per hour. They don't think meters per second. So at 38 meters per second, you're looking at a little bit under 100 miles per hour. So, uh, you know, we could figure it out real quick. It's going to be about 38. It ends up being about 85. All right. So this is this is how they design these uh, these these exit ramps. Is they ask, okay, so what kind of conditions, you know? What we expect, rainy conditions, dry conditions, what's the average tire look like? You built in a factor of about 20% or so that says that, you know, even if things get that much more wet or slippery or whatever, you know, uh, we'll, we'll be okay. And that's how you take and you post your speed limit. Okay. This also tells you the reason why, you know, uh, as, as the radius of curvature of your your exit gets smaller as this number gets smaller, the velocity or the speed rather, the average speed of your car as it goes around is going to get that much smaller as well. So, you know, you, you can't take a hairpin curve like that, you know, doing a hundred. I guess you could, but you would end up going in a straight line. Okay. Yeah. So let's do another example. Okay. So here's a more complicated example dealing with friction. Um, what incline with a bank track in a corner with a radius of curvature of 150 meters need to be raised to in order to prevent a car traveling at 150 miles per hour from sliding in the turn? Assume sticky rubber on asphalt with a static coefficient of 1.2. Now, if you've ever watched NASCAR, you know, you've spent $10 on eight ounces of stale Bud Light to go sit out at the track and watch cars make lefts for hours upon end then you're aware that between the corners, the track is flat and level, but the corners are actually elevated. So uh, we say that they're banked. And here, if you think about it, if you were to sort of look on edge at what one of these tracks might look like, these banks, if you will. Let me make a car here. Actually, I want that. So here's a tire right here. Oops. So attach the tire to the car there. And here's another tire right here. So like, here's our car, right? And uh, let me grab the whole thing and move it over here. I'm going to put the car on the track like this. So if you were to sort of look at this thing on edge, if I can get this to balance right, like that, it would look like this. So in this case, the car is moving away from us. So the car is moving into, you know, the page here. And, uh, you know, here's your, your, your banking angle, if you want to call it that. Now, so the car has got mass. So gravity is pulling it down into the ground like that. And as it pushes on the track, there's a normal force. Now remember, normal forces are at 90 degrees to the surface that force is being applied. So the, the car is pushing into the track, but the surface moves out like this. Now, this direction right here is towards... Uh, the center of the circle that this car is riding on when it goes around one of these corners. Okay, so that's in towards the center. Okay, 
On the other hand, the car's inertia makes it want to slide up the track like this, which means that there is a frictional force this way, it's a static frictional force, that's down this way, down the track. Okay. Now let's talk about angles. Uh, you know, traditionally, since this is an inclined problem, what you would do is you would take and you would, you know, uh, rotate the problem so that the, the plane of the track would be the x-axis and this would be the y-axis and then you would work things you know relative to that you actually get no real benefit here from doing that um you, you end up at the end of the day basically having to uh take the same number of things and uh break them up into components based off the angle anyway so there's no real benefit to it and it serves us well to actually work this problem this way uh so we don't sort of monkey around with the direction of in towards the center of the circle that said though I want to sort of think about what we did in previous problems where we had an incline, where this was straight up and down, and this right here was along x. Now, if you take a look here, and let's just talk angles for a moment, we know when we rotate things, we make this x and this y, that this angle right here is theta as well. But if you were to look at straight up y this way, like for example, let's work it in the coordinates that we see where this is x and this is y, right? So this angle right here is theta as well. And so is this. Uh, you can check it by pretending that you lower the track like that. If you were to lower it, what you would see would be as the track lowered, this angle closes, which means this is theta, which is what we were talking about before. But this one closes as well. This one goes to zero at the same time that this one does, which means that this, th that this is theta. And so does this. So these are both theta, right? So, so here, and uh, let me just give my car a mass. Uh, I don't think the masses are gonna re really going to matter here, but just to be consistent, we'll say it's 1,200 kilograms. Um, so let's draw our, our force diagram, right? So. Uh, here is X, here's Y. I say X, it's really R, right? Where this would be out towards the center of the circle, you know, because because again, you know, uh, this is like an oval track, or at least a, a track that would look something like this, just to give you guys a sense for what the, these things look like. So kind of like this. Copy this. Oops, actually I want to copy that. I want to paste it like this. So, so these are kind of like, you know, what the endpoints of the track would be like. And then the midpoints, you know, would be here and here like that. So, so as you can see, like, you know, the, the, the track itself, the ends where you have the banking at, uh, is, is basically either one big radius of curvature or two on each side like that. And then these are the, the long straightaways where the, the track is level. Okay. So, so here, you know, towards the inside of the, the center of the circle would be this way, this way right here. So that's in the negative R direction. And this is in the positive R direction. And we'll call this a Z as usual. Actually, let me get rid of that. So here's your Z right here. And if you think of angles, right? So, we have gravity, uh, you know, trying to pull the car straight down. We have uh, here, this is our frictional force going off like that. And then up here, we have our normal force going up like that. Okay. And, and once again, as a reminder, uh, here, this is towards the center of the circle. So this would be the direction of the, the centripetal force, basically, like it's in towards the center like that. So, so here we have, uh, you know, oops, where that? here we have the weight, Fg. Uh, we have the normal force right here. This makes a theta with respect to the z-axis. This is a theta as well. Uh, makes it, that's your static frictional force like that. It makes it with respect to the r-axis like that. So, you know, just, just sort of focusing on summing up the forces right here to get the net force. 
we have three forces. We have a normal force. We have the force due to gravity. Plus, we have the static frictional force. And these things are going to, uh, you know, add up to give me m times a, you know, our acceleration. Um, you know, but if you look, for example, here uh, in the z direction, right, we have a part of the normal force that points up. We have a part of the static frictional force that points down, and also uh, the weight points entirely down. So you'd say, you know, n sub z is positive the way this is, minus the static frictional z part minus the weight. And these are actually going to add up to give you zero. And the reason is because as this car goes around this, this embankment, um, it's not bouncing up and down. There's no change in motion in the z direction, right? Uh, in the r direction, though, it's making that circle. So there is. So if you look in the r direction, um, you know, we have uh, a part of the normal force that goes inwards. We have a part of the static frictional force that goes inwards. And this right here is going to equal to, you know, the mass of the car times this entropic acceleration that it experiences, right? And, and in any event, really, the question that we're asking here is the same question, you know, that we've, we've asked, you know, in previous problems dealing with friction, like, for example, this one. We're, we're asking the question, you know, how fast can the car go around the corner before it slides? Here, we're asking, what angle does this need to be at in order to prevent it from sliding? So the minimum angle that you would need would be defined by sort of, you know, the magnitude of the normal force. So on the left-hand side, these two, you know, equaling the centripetal uh, force that would be required in order to keep it on that track as it goes around. So the question is, do these things equal each other? I'm dropping the negative sign because the negative sign, you know, denotes direction. Um, you know, if, if you wanted to be pedantic about it, you'd note the fact that the acceleration is negative as well, and you could put a minus sign out in front and then just cancel everything out. But we're not sp specifically solving for that. You know, we're looking at this right here, and we're asking, you know, the question, what's the angle? So where is the angle going to come from? Well, ultimately, it's going to come from, you know, these components right here that depend upon it, right? So, so that said, let's just think about what we have here. Well, we have a static frictional force, which we know looks like mu sub s times the normal force. We also have a weight, and our weight looks like m times g. So, you know, that's well understood. Um, and we also have these things sitting in, in, in component form, or actually not in component form, but in, you know, magnitude and direction form. And we need to break them up into components anyway. So let's just go ahead and do that before we write our givens out. So let's look at the normal force. So the normal force looks a little bit like this, right? So you have the angle here, theta. You have the normal force here. This would be uh, in R, and this would be in Z, right? Like that. So in terms of sines, cosines, and tangents, uh, you know, the Z part uh, is a cosine part. It's, it's adjacent to the, uh, the angle. So this would be you know, n times cosine of theta. Uh, the, the, the radial part here is, uh, is the sine part. Like that, right? Now let's look at the static frictional force. So, so with that one, uh, it looks like this. Where this is our angle right here. Um, this is F sub S. And then you have, you know, F sub S R and then F sub S Z. So in terms of these things right here, you know, the, the Z part here is the opposite part and the R part is the adjacent part. So what that means is, is that F sub S uh, R, we'll say, uh, is, is, is cosine. So that would be equal to, you know, F sub S cosine of theta and then, you know, F sub S Z is going to be the sine part, and that's, you know, F sub S uh, sine of theta. Now, what I would like to do here um, is to go ahead and plug in the form of F sub S, because we're going we're to need it. Uh, that's mu sub S in cosine of theta. This is mu sub S in sine of theta. Okay, so, so there's what we have. We have all the, 
you know, this is this is basically the physics of the situation right here. And now let's write our uh, our givens out. So what are we given? Um, we know that the car is traveling at 150 miles per hour. We're going to need to convert that. Uh, I'll leave a little bit of space here for that. Um, we know the, the coefficient of static friction here is 1.2 because it's a uh, very sticky. If you've ever seen racing, um, the, the, the type of tires that they use on tracks are incredibly sticky. They don't last for very long. That's the reason why they're continually replaced during a race. Um, and they actually warm them up pretty good. Uh, that's the reason why they do zigzags, you know, in order to get them to work. Uh, we also know the raise of the curvature of our turn is about 150 uh, meters, right? So uh, let's go ahead and convert this, this uh, speed here real quick. And um, let's see if I uh, do a conversion here. Let's see, what do I got? Looks to be about 67.056 meters per second. Okay. Now, so, so that's what we've been given. Um, what are we trying to find? Oh, we may as well put the mass in here too. Sorry. That's up there in the top. I put that in uh, 1200 uh, kilograms. There we go. All right. So uh, what are we trying to find? Uh, we're trying to find theta, right? And again, it's, it's based on this condition right here. You know, if we look at the right side of this equation and say this is basically how much centripetal force that you have to have present in order to make it not slide off the track, on, how do we make the left side equal to the right side? That's the question that we're asking. So we're looking for the angle to make that happen. Um, so that said, let's take a look at the, the equation here in Z right here, this one right here. Um, it says N sub Z minus FS sub Z minus FG is equal to zero. So this is the one that's in Z, right? So let's just go ahead and plug in stuff. Uh, N times cosine of theta, that's N sub Z. Uh, FS sub Z is mu sub S times the normal force times sine of theta. And then FG we know is just MG, and that's equal to zero. Right, you know, as per this equation right here. So, you know, we know the game plan basically is going to be to to probably solve for the normal force in this, and then plug it in over here, and then use our condition here to figure out what we need. But let's go ahead and handle this equation right here. Uh, it says n sub r plus f sub s sub r, and there should be a sub r there. Mistake. Um, the point at which it, if it, if you looked at it funny and it slid, it would be equal is equal to M times a C sub P. So it's a triple acceleration. And what's N sub R? Well, that's, uh, N times sine of theta. Uh, what's F sub S R that's mu sub S times N times cosine of theta. And, uh, this is equal to M v squared over r. Okay, so the question is, is, you know, we know at, at the point in which they're equal, uh, you are right at that cusp, and that's what we're looking for. And basically, any angle above that would be okay, you know, for 150 uh, within reason. So, so what I propose to do is this. Um, we're going to use this equation right here, uh, solve it for the normal force, and then take and put that in here. And what that'll do is to allow us to have an equation that's entirely in things that we know basically except for the angle. Because we don't know what the normal force is, and we don't know what the angle is, but we do know what the coefficient of static friction is, and we do know what the weight of the car is, and g, and all that other stuff. Just like we know what the velocity is and the radius of curvature of the track. And we know everything here except for n and theta. So we're going to solve for n, plug it in, and eliminate it so we have just basically things in terms of theta. Uh, and we're going to use this equation to do it. So here, uh, if I pull the n out of this, I get n times cosine of theta minus mu sub s sine of theta 
is equal to m times g. All I did was to move the mg over to the other side. And then I'm going to divide both sides by this uh, cosine of theta minus mu sub s sine theta. So the normal force really is just equal to uh, m times g divided by uh, cosine of theta minus mu sub s sine of theta, right? So here's your normal force. Now, uh, for the second equation that we had manipulated over here, uh, this one right here, basically, um, let's pull the n out there. And when we do on the left-hand side, that's uh, sine of theta plus mu sub s cosine of theta. And that's going to equal to, uh, you know, mv squared over r. So what I'm going to do is to take and plug this right here in for the n right here. And when I do that, I'm going to end up with uh, m times g uh, sine of theta plus mu sub s cosine of theta on the top. And then on the bottom, I've got cosine of theta uh, minus mu sub s sine of theta, right? Let's make sure everything's looking good here. That looks good. Uh, for the radial part, that looks good. Okay, so, great. Now this is equal to uh, mv squared over r. Because remember, all I did was to take this in right here and plug it in to that right there, right? That's all I did. So, look, the masses don't matter. They cancel like that. Um, I'm actually going to divide both sides by g and move the g under over here. So if I do that, and I've sort of put it over here where I have all my stuff, I have on the top uh, sine of theta uh, plus mu sub s cosine of theta over cosine of theta minus mu sub s sine of theta. And uh, this is going to equal to, since I divided both sides by g, uh, v squared over rg. Okay. Now, uh, we're almost done. Um, what I'm going to do here um, is to pull uh, a cosine out of the top and a cosine at the bottom. And when I do that, that pulls the cosine out of here, but it puts a cosine under here and makes that a tangent. That pulls this cosine out, makes that a 1, and that puts makes this a tangent right here because there's a it'll be a sine over cosine. So if I pull a cosine out of the top and out of the bottom, I get a tangent of theta plus mu sub s on the top, and then on the bottom, I get 1 minus mu sub s tangent of theta, and that's equal to uh, v squared over rg. Okay, now, uh, we're basically set. We know everything here except for theta, right? So, so at this point, really, it's just, you know, algebraic manipulation. In fact, it's been algebraic manipulation uh, since about, oh, I don't know, um, here. It's been algebra since about here. Okay, so I'm going to move this to the right-hand side. If you do that, you have tan theta plus mu sub s is equal to v squared over rg times 1 minus mu sub s uh, tangent of theta. Uh, I'm going to multiply the v squared over rg through. like this. And then I'm going to move this over to the left-hand side. When I do it, it becomes positive. And I'm going to move this over to the right-hand side. When I do it, it becomes negative. Okay. Pull the tangent out. almost home free, uh, and then divide both sides by, by 1 plus this mu sub s v squared over rg.
It looks messy superficially, but we know everything on the right-hand side. We know how fast the car is going. It's all up over here. In fact, I'm going to take and snag all these givens and what we're trying to find here. Real Oops, I didn't mean to do that. Snag all these things right here. Let me copy it. Huh. Um, and uh, let's see here. We paste it. Bring it down over here. Just so we have what we're, you know, dealing with. And, uh, you know, like I said, we know everything here. Okay. And mass doesn't even matter. Okay. Now you could, if you wanted to clean this up more, uh, is it worth it? Quite honestly, probably not. Uh, so, uh, if you take the inverse tangent of both sides, let me write this monstrosity out here. Uh, V squared over RG minus mu sub s divided by 1 plus mu sub s v squared over rg. And then you plug in the stuff that we know. Uh, that's uh, 67.056 meters per second squared over 150 meters times 9.8 meters per second squared minus 1.2 divided by 1 plus 1.2 times 67.056 meters per second squared divided by 150 meters times 9.8 meters per second squared not the prettiest thing in the world, I know, but like I said, we know everything there. So um, let's see, what do you get when you do this? This is a bit of a mess. All right, so I get uh, 21.7 degrees. Or, you know, if you want to stick with your sig figs here, there's two there, there's two there, two there, two there. So about 22 degrees. So if you were to bank the track to about 22 degrees, you should be okay at 150. You just wouldn't want to crosswind at that point because it would blow you off the track. So any, any, basically any angle that's substantially above this, you'd be okay with. And like I said, they usually sort of gun for about a uh, 20%, um, you know, uh, allowance there. So you take the 150 multiplied by 1.2 to make it, uh, you know, an additional 20% on top of that. And they would plan the track on based off of that. So, so this concludes our discussion, um, about centripetal force. Um, what I want to do next time is to do some more complicated problems that sort of involve everything that we've discussed so far and I'll mention, uh, I'll mention, you know, uh, drag and wind resistance and things like that a little bit. Uh, at this particular level of uh, detail, uh, they're not very worthwhile, except you know, from a conceptual standpoint. Uh, but were you to, uh, you know, go further into your physics education, say in classical mechanics, you would see uh, an enormous treatment of it. And I'll see you then.